So uh, welcome everybody to our second edition of our online computer vision and artificial intelligence workshop. Uh, for those of you who don't remember me from our first workshop, my name is Jose. Uh, here with me, we have uh, several of my assistant hackers. Uh, maybe you guys would like to say hi to the audience. Hello, my name is Rick. Uh, I'm assistant hacker of this hackathon. And I'm also a master's student of Nodin Lab. Hello, I'm Jeka. I also is the uh, hackathon assistant. In, and I also is the master's student in the Nodin Lab. Hello, everyone. My name is Ren Wu. I'm the chat master of the hackathon session. Please feel free to write your question and comments in YouTube and Twitch chat. I will gather them and report to the hackers. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, so as I mentioned before, my name is Jose. Uh, I'm a PhD student here at the Norling Lab. It's a pleasure to have all of you here joining us. Um, today we have a very special thing for you guys because today actually what we have for you is our submission for the OpenCV and AI competition for 2021, which is uh, trying to quantify the motor function of Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, but before we start, I would like to say thank you to several important people. Uh, I would just like to mention uh, several of our sponsors. Uh, here we, we, we would like to say that we are very grateful to the first uh, the Taiwan and, and Europe International Cooperation Fund. And we also like to thank uh, the Taiwan Artificial Intelligence Association, Crowd Helix, OpenCV, and Luxonis uh, for sponsoring us in our workshop as well as NCKU. Uh, without their help, it, would, it wouldn't be possible to continue to serve uh, the Spatial AI community. We would also like to thank all of our speakers who have decided to uh, contribute to our workshop. And we'll also like to thank all of you for joining us um, so that we can all learn together. Uh, we are very happy to be able to do all of this uh, workshop for all of you. Um, so as I mentioned before, now we can start getting into what we have for you today. Um, so for today, we would like to show you what we have done as part of our submission for the open CV and AI competition for 2021, which is, as I mentioned before, to quantify the motor function of Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, here we have the, the outline for you guys. Um, so we will start by just introducing what is Parkinson's disease and why this problem is so hard to do and also why do we wanna solve this problem. Um, then we will talk about what are the current methods for quantifying the motor function of Parkinson's disease patients. Then we will talk about our methods. So what computer vision methods did we use to uh, try to do this? And then we will talk about you know, further analysis on the data and then what, are, what did we get and what, what conclusions can we get and we draw from our results. Uh, so to start, um, Parkinson's disease is the second most common disease, neuro neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. It is caused by the loss of dopaminergic neurons which causes patients to gradually lose their motor functions and their ability to take care of themselves uh, before they eventually die from complication of this disease. Um, it is actually a very uh, serious disease which causes a lot of burden in society. Like for example, in 2016, uh, this disease caused uh, a global loss of 3.2 million disability adjusted life years or DALIs and roughly 200,000 dead. So for those of you who are not from the uh, medical field, a DALI is, is uh, the summation of the years lived with disability and years of life lost. What does that actually mean? So let's suppose that uh, the average life expectancy of a human is say what, 80 years, right? And then this person died at 70, from Parkinson's disease. So that means that that person had 10 years of life lost, but probably that person had Parkinson's disease from way before he died. 
So let's say when he was 60 or she was 60, that means that that person was 15 years of live 15 live 10 years of his life with disability and then uh, missed 10 years of his average life uh, of the average life expectancy due to this disease. So that 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 caused the dalit to be 20 years for this person, which you could understand that um, as societies as technology develops and, and medical uh, advances also uh, come forward we as humans tend to live longer and this disease this this type of neurodegenerative diseases will end up being even a bigger burden to society even in even in countries like for example taiwan we already have the the majority of the population uh, being of old age and this is the case for most of industrialized countries like for example in europe and um, other parts of the world where the in, the burden of this increases right uh, as time goes by so this is why this is a very important um, problem for us to try to solve right now uh, but especially for for me and for I would say my group more than the economic laws more than the, the, the time spent on uh, or, or the resources spent I think the, the reason for why we would like to solve this problem is can be seen here. Um, so here I would just like to show you a very short, uh, roughly two minute video of a person that suffers from resting tremor, uh, which is one of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So let me just um, open this video. Oh. Excuse me for a second. So before we, is, is, is the video showing on my screen right now, guys? All right. Um, so, wait a second for me. Um, so here we have this patient that suffers from Parkinson's disease. And I would just like, before we watch the video, I just would like to mention that this is a, a, about a product that they have developed which aims to control this resting tremor. So right now they're just testing his motor skills. So they're telling him to just have his hands um, um, stand uh, in front of him and then touch his nose and then touch the examiner's finger. And then you can see how the shaking actually affects his ability to do this. And now it's telling me to have a sip of his water. Now, here he has the device turned on right and you can see how the shaking ha happens now they're telling him to turn his device off he's turning the device off and then he will wait a couple of seconds so that the tremor you see so you can see like how would the tremor be if he didn't have the device on so he's just turning it off right now i'm just gonna wait a couple of seconds all right, so now can you see how different the, sh the shaking is, like the amplitude, the frequency of this shaking? He's not trying to do this, he's just, he cannot control his hands. And you can see how ob he, he totally misses the finger right now um, of the examiner and he has so much difficulty to, to do this simple task, right? And yeah, so here he's trying to take a sip of his water. To me, this is the part that gets to me the most, like when you see somebody who cannot, okay, so now he's turning it back on. And the video is almost finished, but I would like you to see just this part. You see, you see how relieved this patient is after he turns the device on and his tremor is attenuated. Um, 
as I mentioned before, uh, to me, the part that gets to me the most is the fact that you see this adult person, right? Who, who knows who could, could have been somebody very skilled. He could be like a neurosurgeon. He could be some somebody who that you know, I don't know, like um, uh, maybe some electrician or something. That somebody who require uh, a lot of skill with his hands. And right now, you see this person cannot even do the simple task of just taking a sip of his water by himself. So he would need assistance from somebody else, right? In this case, you imagine that it's just this once time, this once that he's trying to get a sip of water, but he he has to live with this disability all the time, right? Imagine you needing help to to take a sip of water or Let's say, for example, in, our, in other cases, it could be maybe getting a fork to your mouth or brushing your teeth, right? It, it must be something very, uh, very troublesome, very uh, pitiful, you know. Um, and that's what that's that's the, that's our aim, right? Because through accurate quantification of the motor functions of Parkinson's disease patients, we can observe the progression of the disease. And if we can observe the progression of the disease, then we can take action to solve the problem earlier, right? At the earlier stages, when you can still do something. So let me go back again to my presentation. Yes. So, um, so now let's let's go into you know what are the current methods for uh, quantification of motor function of, of Parkinson's disease patients. So, well, before we go into what is the the golden standard for uh, quantifying PD and motor skills, uh, we will you know just kind of re-emphasize again, uh, why do we want to do this, right? Why do we want to quantify PD? So as I mentioned before, is to be able to, um, you know, understand the progression of the disease, number one, right? And to try to take early action. And also, be, but in more practical terms, if you can accurately quantify the motor function of Parkinson's disease patients, you can adjust the dose of their medication because several of these patients take some kind of drug so that they can, you know, relax that their ner the nerve nervous system and then they are able to control their hands or, well, actually Parkinson's disease affects many motor functions of the body, not only the hands, it can affect, for example, the feet or the, your ability to walk or there are several stuff that we will discuss a little bit later. Uh, but also, it can uh, um, it can help in the clinical trials developing novel therapies towards PD. So let's say that you want to develop a new drug to to help people with Parkinson's disease, right? To 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 attenuate their tremor or or help in in any kind of their motor fun, uh, motor skills, but you need accurate quantification of their motor functions to see, okay, is this drug actually working or not, right? Um, so that's the reason for why we wanna do this. Um, so far, the golden standard for quantifying uh, the motor function of Parkinson's disease patient is this one, uh, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. This uh, is, is uh, like a, a, a set of questions that a physician and a subject are supposed to feel, right? And I would like to mention that there has been a revision of this rating scale by the Movement Disorder Society. So now the actual gold standard is the MDS, so for Movement Disorder, Movement Disorder Society, uh, UPDRS score. Uh, but the problem with this score is that, uh, as we see it, uh, two, there are two main problems. The first one is that it is subjective. So what do, you, what do I mean by subjective? So what, what typically happens when a patient with Parkinson's disease wants to get 
his motor skill quantified. Okay, so this person, this patient, will go to the doctor, right, to a physician, and then the physician will, you know, get this MDS super DRS score, which is like a, a a bunch of pages, right? And then some of the pages the patient has to fill himself, and some of the pages the physician has to fill himself. So you understand that where this subjectiveness can come, because first of all, the patient can feel different about his symptoms from the day to day, right? You know, um, like it depends on whether the, many different factors, right? Uh, but also like the, 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 for example, the experience of the doctor, you know, can also affect like uh, in, in, the interrater variability because for example, a more experienced doctor would tend to uh, maybe provide different scores than a non-experienced one. So it's a, it's a, it's a bias that is introduced from both sides. Um, and, and the another problem that we identify is that it is coarse. So coarse in this case, because uh, the, whether it is the subject himself or the physician, they have the options of selecting integer based numbers. So from zero to four, depending on the severity of the of of on the degradation that they display that day for their motor skills right so they can either choose zero or one or two or three or four but what happens if you want to select for example what happens if a subject is you look at it and it is it, very it looks like it's going to be 0 0.5 or 3.2 or 4.7 or or well, not 4.7 like 2.7 or is usually the maximum right uh, for 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 this uh, scale, so you cannot, so you you need to like kind of like round up or round round down <laughs> your scale. So that poses a problem because then your quantification is again not accurate enough for, especially um, for for when you wanna uh, look at the de progression of these diseases, right? you you will probably be suddenly at one scale. Uh, 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 probably have one rating and then it suddenly jump, right? Uh, because probably because the the rating or, or maybe you the, you will jump up and down because the the rating is not consistent, right? Because it's just by the nature of this test. So, for example, here I have uh, an extract of uh, the finger tapping section of the MDS UPDRS score. So here, I would like just to point out several things. Like for example, they have the so it's the name of the test, right? That is called finger tapping, and here they have the instructions to the examiner. So here they just tell, uh, well, how to do the test, right? They tell him that uh, you need to demonstrate the task, but not while the patient is doing the task, and you need to tell the patient for, for this finger tapping test, you need to tell the patient to tap his index finger and thumb uh, as fast and as big as possible. Uh, now, big is a, is a, is a, is a term that I, I wouldn't necessarily use because it's a little bit ambiguous and vague. But <clears throat> to tap this, uh, the, the, their fingers like this, right? Uh, and then they would rate each side, so one for the right side. So you, that's why you can see here there's a box for R, and then one for the left side. And what they need to look at is the speed, the amplitude, the agitation, house, and decrement of speed. So you can see also here that they also describe uh, based on their uh, from zero to four, right? Uh, what will correspond to a zero? What will co correspond to a two? Or for uh, you know for all the way on to four, right? But you can see that. Uh, it is um, not the clearest explanation in the world. Uh, so it depends a lot on the experience of the uh, of the rater, of the physician who is rating the, the the subject, right? And that's what that's where that that this is um, uh, where we think we can help in this part. Okay, so just uh, before we move into uh other other, other parts uh, so uh, other common clinical syndromes of pd it, it could be a combination of bradykinesia 
So the first, the, what we saw in the video was tremor, right? Tremor is an involuntary rhythmic muscle contraction leading to shaking movements. That's what we saw the patient in the video do, that where he couldn't, he couldn't lift the, his, uh, the, the cup of water because he had the tremor. But there's also brachykinesia, which is like slowness of movement. There's rigidity, which corresponds to the stiffness or, of arms and legs beyond of what would be from normal aging or arthritis because as you age, you, you, you tend to develop rigidity. And also a guide disturbance, which is like a, a irregular postural balance, right? Impaired postural balance, right? So it is worth noting that in the past years, there has been several studies that aim to quantify the motor function of Parkinson's disease patients. But what they aim to do is to attach sensors to collect data. Like for example, there's this study that, that was putting uh, like uh, this uh, smart watches on people on the wrist and these smart watches, they have uh, gyroscopes, right? So an accelerometer, so they would like try to, uh, you know, look at the data to, to, to assess the, how, how is the shaking of these patients. Uh, or for example, they would have a carpet with uh, sensors and then they will make the subject walk in the carpets to, to see like what is the force that the subject is exerting as it moves to the carpet, right? To see how is their, their balance. Uh, and also there's a lot of researchers who have been trying to use the, the uh, mobile phones, smart, uh, smartphones, right? Because these phones actually, they contain a lot of sensors already. They contain, you know, accelerometers, so you can put like in your pocket, right? And and kind of like see how how do you walk? There are actually several apps that already can count your steps by just having your phone in your pocket, or you know they um, have the many different sensors, right? Uh, but oh, so there's there's also several studies that uh, develop apps, right? So they will have like the app and they would teach through the app, the, the subject, how to do the test. So they, for example, for the finger tapping, uh, they will have this app where there will be like these bars going down and then the subject needs to go go down uh, together with the bar. So if the subject uh, uh, displays some kind of halts or hesitations, then the app will quantify that, right? And it will tell the subject uh, right then and there, uh, what was his score? Um, I think, uh, so quantification is also important in this sense because it, it is a step forward to helping uh, go, get to the point of telemedicine where the subject also can just do this test by him or herself in, in the comfort of her home, right? Because most of the subjects, as you can see, they have uh, impaired mobility and for them, for the most severe cases, it might be hard to actually go to the doctor and get them tested, right? Maybe not so convenient, so it, it's it's usually better if the subject can do it by by him or herself. Okay, so now we discuss what is the problem that uh, we are trying to solve, and we kind of discuss we touch a little bit on why this problem is important. So now we're going to the methods part, and for the methods, we will discuss how how are we going to attempt to solve this problem. So what we want to do is to predict the UPDRS scores of PD patients from video recordings of their test. So uh, like you saw on the extract of the UPDRS score, like they tell the doctors, uh, you should look at you know several stuff when you're determining the score of the patient. That's what we also want to look at. Uh, we will look at um, amplitude, frequency, hesitation, interruptions of the movements while performing the test. And we originally want to get, uh, want to predict these metrics and then just use this uh, multilayer perception to then predict the UPDRS scores of, of the patients with these metrics. That's, that's to have a model, explainable model. Um, so the, 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 the challenge that we faced was that as soon as we got accepted to be finalists in the OpenCV and AI competition for this year, uh, Taiwan entered this level three lockdown due to COVID-19 and the hospitals at which we were doing experiments, they kind of uh, 
prohibited any kind of data collection, you know, for biosecurity reasons. So we we were we were not able to collect data from any for, for from any PD pages at all, actually. Uh, so what we have decided to do instead is to predict uh, different metrics, uh, for, namely the 2D Euclidean distance between fingers, the velocity of the fingers, and whether the fingers are in an opening or closing motion from two healthy subjects. And that's what we submitted to the to the to this year's competition. So, for example, uh, here we have on the left side a subject performing the finger tapping test, and that's why I chose also the the, the finger tapping extract from from the UPDR MDS UPDRS rating scale. So here we have the subject performing the test, right? Of uh, try, trying to tap his thumb and index finger as fast as they can. Several things I would like to uh, make notice of. So you can see that, first of all, the subject is in a control environment. It is in this box in which we, we very strictly control the position of the cameras and also the angle of the cameras and, well, the background. And you can see that it has these stickers uh, this red sticker on, the, on her thumb and this blue sticker uh, that actually help us to use traditional computer vision methods to track the trajectories of the fingers and extract the metrics that I mentioned before that are the Euclidean distance between fingers, the velocity of the fingers, well, that's extracted from the position, that's the, the derivative of the position, and the uh, whether the fingers are opening or closing, they are obtained from the local minimum and maxima of the cleaner distance. So for example, if the distance is after a local mi uh, minima, then you know that the fingers will be opening. And after a local maxima, you know that the fingers will be closing. Uh, and this, these videos, we filmed them using the OGD cameras. Uh, so, and this is the part of the, of, of, of the workshop that we're gonna demonstrate today. We're gonna demonstrate how do we actually collect the data and, and, and and analyze their trajectories. So once you get this uh, video, then you can apply traditional computer vision methods, the ones that we're gonna show today, to be able to extract here the three metrics. So here I have normalized them for you. So the blue line corresponds to the Euclidean and distance, the, red, the, blue, the green one corresponds to the velocity, and the uh, orange one is a binary variable that just tells you zero if it is closing or or, or one if it is opening. Um, so here we have the labels for what would be like a half a second observation window. We film at 60 frames per second. So we select three frames that correspond to half a second. Um, yeah, so we have the subjects have a red and blue sticker have red and blue stickers that allow us to use traditional computer vision methods to extract the metrics. And then we would use the, a 3D CNN to predict the labels. So the labels, uh, what I mean is this, these lines, right? So we will have a CNN to predict the Euclidean distance. We will have a CNN to, to predict the velocity. We will have a CNN to predict whether the fingers are opening or closing. Uh, and in a clinical setting, we want to remove any kind of stickers and do the motor quantification fully non-contact. Because I think that there is the gap that we feel as a group uh, that we will be able to do it just from video recording, right? No, nothing attached to the skin of the subject, you know, nothing that can cause rashes, nothing that can make the subject uncomfortable. Everything would just be, you know, through the lens of a camera. Um, so for this workshop, I believe, given that we have this limited two hour time, um, we will not be able to do the sh showing how did we actually train the uh, 3D CNN, which is uh, actually uh, for me one of the most interesting parts of our submission. But we would, I, I think we will do this one for the next workshop, for workshop number three. So stay tuned for that. Um, I think that will be a very interesting one. Um, but for, for today, we will focus mainly on the data collection part, right? So what and, and the analysis of the trajectories. Of, of the of the fingers using the OD. Uh, so just to you know bring everything together again, 
um, we we would like to show this um, why, what, how figure of our um, of our project. So here we in in our lab we really like to use this figure to explain all of our projects because they kind of give you like an overview of of uh, what is the project about. So in here, um, we want to, so what do we want to do? So basically <clears throat> the what part is that we will, there will be a patient with Parkinson's disease, right? And then this patient would come to us and then he will do the motor test. So he will do maybe like the uh, finger tapping or toe tapping test, so finger tap or, or, or hand movement test. And then we will record it and then we will quantify, we, they will return their, their scores, right? And then we'll be able to uh, quantify the, the progression of their disease. Um, so then the how part is, well, uh, so we will have the subjects so do this test. So one, one of the tests is to open and close their hands, right? Uh, that's, um, uh, another test from the UPDRS uh, rating scale or, or to assess the tremor and then we will record it and then we will use signal processing methods or artificial neural networks to then, you know, provide the trajectories of the fingers with the peaks, the peaks standing for uh, maybe um, whether the maximum skin area, right, or in the, in the minimum skin area or maybe the, in this case, the peaks correspond to uh, the maximum amplitude of the movement and and, and a local minima will be like when the fingers are closing. And then we'll provide uh, you know, other kinds of uh, uh, results. And the why it will be uh, to, because we want to provide a more uh, objective assessment of this score. Uh, we will also like to so try to solve this one because this is a very, uh, uh, time consuming and a uh, resource consuming problem. Um, then we will also like to dig digitalize the assessment. So without the need of any doctors, and we will also want to reduce the errors in the scoring. Um, so, for this workshop, as I mentioned before, we would like to focus on the data collection part using the OCD camera and trajectory analysis using the traditional computer vision methods. If we were just going to describe our, our analysis for the trajectories in a very high level, we would describe it as the following. So the first thing that we would do is that we the subject has this, for example, this red. I don't know if you can see it on my screen. It has the red and blue stickers on their hand, right? And so the point is that and the, the subject is under a control conditions. Uh, so we have a, defined a protocol in which we tell the subject to put their hand in a box that we have created, right? And, to, and we define like where the camera is going to be and, you know, the lighting and all of the stuff. And then the subject is going to perform the test, right? So we want to segment the areas that, for example, we want to segment all the red areas, right? So we will look at the image and we will try to threshold the image according to what area is red and then what area is blue. I think for next week, we have a speaker that aims to find uh, yellow yellow balls in images. So I, I, I actually don't, don't know the name of the speaker right now, but I think that uh, seems an interesting uh, talk. If you would like to have a, a more detailed explanation of how to do this process, if you're, for example, a beginner, I think maybe my assistant Rain can help me to uh, share that link with you guys in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, for this, for today, I will try to explain it as clearly as possible. What, what is the process that we do? But yeah, if you would like more, right? More more material, then I recommend you to join that talk because that, that talk is very interesting. Um, so then once we get those maps, right, so we're going to get binarized map. We're going to get, okay, from this image, which pixels fall inside the red 
range. And then we're gonna another we're gonna get another map from these pictures, which pixels fall inside the blue range, right? And it's gonna be either black. Uh, it's gonna be a, a, a yes or no thing, right? A yes or no uh, variable, a binary variable. And then we're going to use half circles to detect the, the whatever looks like a circle in our in our maps in our binarized map. And then, but half circles sometimes it, it can return many circles, right? Or, or even stuff that doesn't look like a circle. Uh, or, or 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 many different radius of circle because it. I think my my our, my assistant will explain how that how does that work, method work in more detail later. But the, then we select the two circles with the most similar radii, radii because we assume that if the subject has the stickers attached to the finger, right, then the subject and, and the finger and the hand is perpendicular to the camera, like this. Then the fingers, even though I move my finger like this or like this, right, the radii of the stickers will be roughly similar. So we assume that uh, the two the two circles with the most similar radii are the stickers on. Uh, correspond to these two stickers that are on the hand, right? And then for this workshop, we would calculate that the Euclidean distance between the circles, right? And then the velocity stems from that, and the classification of the movement also stems from, from that result. <clears throat> and so, that's all, uh, so I would like to mention that for this workshop, we actually went a step further, and we extended our circle detection to 3D, by using a, 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 the depth map calculated from both mono cameras on the OCD. So this is something that we actually didn't do on our mission, but we should we, we could have done. Um, but yeah, so, but we have done it for this workshop. So stay, stay, stay in tune for that. Okay, so now we are about to start our coding session for today. I hope that I, uh, that you guys understand why do you want to solve this problem, right? Um, how do you want to solve it, right? And, and why, more, more, more importantly, uh, why this problem is worth solving. Uh, but before we dive deep into the code and into the most interesting part of today's hackathon, I would like to take a little five minutes break. Um, so we'll be back in five minutes and I hope that you guys are ready to start coding together. And um, I'll see you very soon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, there's a uh, couple of things that I would just like to uh, clarify. So um, here, if we, I have on my screen the uh, our our website that shows the all the workshops actually. So we, if you go to the third. Uh, online computer and artificial workshop, third online computer vision and artificial artificial intelligence workshop, which is gonna be held uh, next week. Then, if you go to the speakers, it it will show you what we have for that workshop. And the guy that I was talking about about the, the detecting the yellow balls is uh this is this one a uh, Yagmohan Meher. Uh, so he's gonna hold his talk. Uh, August 25th at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, I believe this is Taiwan time. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be something that I'm looking forward to to look at as well. Uh, so please check it out. Um, also, if you like what we're doing, it, it, will, it, will, it, will, it will really uh, we will really be grateful if you could like give us a like on Facebook as well. Um, so yeah, so this is what we have for next workshop. So uh, maybe you can also write the link of the third workshop for in, in the chat. Yeah, my, my assistant Rain will help you to do that. Um, wow. And then, uh, so let's go into the code. So here, what we have is, uh, is the device host interaction diagram. So this is uh, very similar to what we see. We, we introduced these kind of diagrams on the first workshop. Uh, I would like to have my assistant Rick explain this diagram while I'm uh, 
while I'm coding. So just let me pull out the the diagram. Right? Just give me a second. Uh, oh wow. Let me pull out the, the PDF of that diagram. And then I'm gonna have my code. Okay, so as I am uh, coding, uh, is, is the diagram visible, guys? Yes, yes. Yeah? All right. Uh, as I'm coding, uh, my assistant Rick will give you an explanation of this diagram. Yeah, so uh, this diagram is kind of similar like we did in this workshop, uh, the full preview one. So in this diagram inside the pipeline, we will create a color camera. And the color camera is responsible for sending out the our preview frame. RGB frame, and then we'll create two mono camera and link to a stereo depth. And the stereo depth will send out the disparity map uh, to get our 3D information. So also, uh, if I want to send out the message from pipeline to whole site, I need an s thing out. So both color camera and stereo depth will link to a thing out to host site. And inside the host site, we will get RGB frame, right? So get RGB, RGB frame. So then we will use the host support to detect region of interest and combine it with our demo and to get a 3D location. And about this part, I think we will discuss more detail in next figure. Thank you very much, Rick, for your explanation. Uh, so as you have, well, last time we introduced what is the flowchart when you uh, write code to use your depth AI camera. So here, I would just like to show that I have my depth AI camera here mounted on this uh, stand. The camera is pointing downwards to my table. I have connected my camera to my computer, right? And uh, the first thing that you do when you are trying to write code to use this camera is to like as i mentioned before <clears throat> uh, import your required packages so for this one we're going to use depthai numpy cv2 and maplotlib pyplot as plt and then the next step will be to create to define a pipeline right what, what how how does how, what is the camera going to do right so basically this corresponds to the device side so the first thing uh, that I need to do, for example, is create this color camera. So I'm defining the color camera like this. So cam RGB is gonna be five line create color camera. Uh, I have something one to eight. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, you guys can notice uh, in a device host figure, and uh, we were using uh, a calibration function and calling the align and to lay the RGB frame to measure the dips. If you want to, uh, it, if we don't use in this function, uh, then we are not matching the, matching the dip frame and uh, the RGB frame since the, they are, uh, since the dip frame is uh, calculate the result by left right uh, mono camera. So the, perspective is different with the RGB camera. And this is why we do the list line and uh, audience can see the uh, see the list in our code later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rick. So one of the different things that you can notice already from right now is that we're setting the ISP scale to be one, two. Maybe one of my assist hackers can explain what is this ISP and why do we need this one? Rick or 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 Jacob, can you explain the what about the IS, ISP? What is what is it okay, and why okay. do we need this one? Uh, so the ISP, the full name of ISP is actually image signal processor. 
So what this processor do is uh, you get image from your image sensor, like right? So this is raw data, and the signal processor is doing is to set the focal and set the exposure and set the white bed white balance automatically. So that's what they been do. And here we use the output of ISP means we we get the thread like that the processor. Uh, adjust this parameter for us, and we just already use this thing. And maybe, maybe you will remember in last workshop we use the preview output. So the difference between the ISP output and the preview output is, uh, ISP output. If I want to get a preview output, I need to get a ISP output first, and send the ISP to the image post processing to get a preview output. So the reason why we using the preview output for less workshop is the preview output is actually is like most mostly suitable for a small size preview image. And that's the difference. It's kinda of like the transfer the format. Yeah, that's it. All right. Yes, thank you. Um so the idea is that, uh, yes, the ISP is like the raw image, right? And then for this case, what we want to do is to identify which area of the image corresponds to the circle. And then we want to observe, look at the depth map at the same coordinates. And then uh, for, for, the, for that specific ROI, we want to calculate the average of all the depths the, the, because each pixel has a depth value, right? And then um, we will look at the average of all of those depth values, and then that's going to be the, the depth of our sticker to get the, the, our sticker in 3D position. Um, but we need we need our color image to be aligned with our depth map, and that's why we align them through through this uh, uh, color uh, ISP method. Uh, so you can see here, I have created my color camera. One of the things that I did right now was instead of setting the the color order to RGB, I set it to BGR. Uh, that's because I'm going to do some color conversion later. I'm going to look at the color in the HSV color scale. And it's just easier to transform it directly from BGR than from RGB because there is no direct conversion from RGB to HSV in OpenCV. Um, then another thing that I have created is this X link out, right? Because I want to obtain the the RGB RGB map from from the camera, uh, and then now I am creating my two mono cameras that I'm going to use for the depth. So uh, first, I you know I just created like by setting pipeline set create mono camera two times, and then I'm uh, I'm right now assigning the board sockets for each camera. So the cam the mono left is going to be uh, camera board socket left. And I'm also going to uh, down uh, set the resolution to 400p so that we can have a faster speed for calculating the depth map. So we're gonna set resolution, mono camera property, sensor resolution the 400p mono right gonna be set resolution die mono camera properties sensor resolution the 400p um seems that this is what i need so i'm gonna print I'm gonna print created mono cameras. I'm gonna test my code, right? We need to test the code as we, as we go so that we don't have just a bunch of code that we cannot debug later. So it seems like it created both things correctly. See that there's no problem. Then now I'm gonna create my stereo object.
paid stereo depth. Uh, I'm gonna set a confidence threshold of 200, like last time. I am going to align it to the to my uh, color camera. Set uh, align. Set that the line. Align it to what? Die camera board socket, the RGB one, which is the middle camera. Uh, I'm going to, what else? Oh, I'm going to set the left right check. Set left right check as true, because that's needed for the alignment. And then I'm going to set medium field die uh, stereo depth properties um, median filter and then I need to sign what size of my filter do I want is the code uh, large enough for everybody to see do, do you think I could it's okay okay yeah good. and by the way before you uh, move on there's a question in Twitch chat sure so question is, excuse me, did you create a depth color map using Matplotlib, right? Sorry, did you create a depth column? Color, color map. Uh, yes, we will, you will, we will plot the depth using uh, Matplotlib, yes. Who has that question? Well, it's um, Seba, I don't know, I don't really know how to pronounce it. So. All right. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, I think uh, all of these figures that you see on the right, they have been plotted using Matplotlib, and we will demonstrate how to plot all of this. You will be able to, after today's workshop, you'll be able to plot all of this as well. Uh, so don't worry about that. Um, then we need to set the median kernel. So I think that's enough for my depth. I need to create this also this X link out node. So I go X out. Let me call it, I, I, actually I wanna bring the disparity. Disparity. Uh, gonna be pipeline, create X link out, and then X out this disparity set. Uh, I say the last yeah? line is not uh, equal, is that. Sorry? The line twenty A is not equal. It's oh not. yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean light on it x out disparities? That's sorry, that, 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 that's right. Yeah, I think it's correct because this is the yeah because you're creating the x link out. So every time you create it, you need to assign it to a two. But I think yeah. But let, let well the best way to know if is to test it right. Yeah. Okay, let's test it and then we will see. So let me just print something to make sure that all of all of the lines until now are are running without any problem. Uh, created stereo object. Uh, uh -huh. What am I getting? It says uh, oh, just deprecate. It's just a warning. Oh, okay. I should use uh, initial config, set confidence threshold. Uh, but it, I think it's working for right now. It's just, just a warning about some deprecating stuff that is going to happen soon. Okay. So now I have created all of my objects here. So now it's time to link everything together from the device side, right? Um, so now it's time for linking. Um, so what are we gonna link? We are going to link the cam RGB. What? What? What about this? The ISP link to the X out RGB input. What else are we going to link here? We need to link these two cameras, right, to the stereo depth. So the mono left out. Going to link, going to link to the stereo 
left and the mono right out it's going to link to the stereo right then i want to get the disparity map from this stereo object so stereo what i'm going to get from the stereo the disparity oh not this one it's going to link to the x out disparity input okay um <laughs> what does my uh system hacker think about this problem seems correct right this is things everything that i need yes i think it's correct yeah uh let's see let's see let's see so finish gradient pipeline run the code okay it's printed that it's finished creating the pipeline which is good until now. Um, so now I have imported my packages. I have defined my pipeline. The next step is to start a pipeline, right? So you start a pipeline by first creating a device, right? You want to, you want to assign a device, a, a pipeline. So that device is die device, and you're going to assign this pipeline. And then you just simply start the device by saying device start pipeline. Very simple. Then the device is gonna start recording stuff right, and sending stuff to your host in a, in a queue. So you can get the items from the queue from just calling the queue. So you can go queue RGB, for example, is gonna be device get output queue. But here I have two queues, right? I have the RGB that is sending from the camera and also the, the disparity map. So how do I know which one is which? Well, that's why because in the, I, I set their names in, the, in here, in the stream name. So the, this one, so the RGB is going to be, uh, I guess RGB. And I set a max size of the queue of four and I'm gonna make it have a blocking behavior of false gonna do some similar thing for the disparity queue this is gonna be device get output queue in this case gonna be name you can name it disk gonna be max size of max size of four and having a blocking behavior of false all right so now i'm gonna now i'm gonna go into the post processing part right now i have get i'm getting items from my queue now i'm gonna go into my post processing uh part which my assistant jacob is going to help me with i'm just uh so now we basically have finished this part right uh, I'm going to switch the, the diagram into uh, what happens in the post processing. So here, uh, um, in this diagram, we have a little bit of what's happening. Like you can see that okay, we're gonna get the uh, RGB frame. And we're gonna get a depth map, and then we're just gonna put the distance in the in the in the in the stickers, the distance from the camera on on top of the stickers. But this is a very high level diagram, right? We have made a different diagram that uh, goes more into depth of what is actually happening. So let me just replace this one with this one. So maybe my assistant Jacob can help me to explain this one. Yes. Uh, so the main idea of the post-processing and is uh, we create a uh, RGB frame and uh, disparity map uh, first. And let's see the RGB role first. Uh, we create uh, the blue and the red mask based on uh, our settings colors range. And then we doing a circle detection based on the whole circle operations. 
the detection sometimes will uh, detect other thing, just a uh, previous thing. And so we need to using the sizing to finding the similar size pair. Uh, then we have the we have the right range, uh, the right circle detection. Uh, then we get a range of the box to calculate the average uh, disparity based on the uh, circle box. And after we get in the average disparity and we just use in the transfer ratio to change the disparity value to the depth value. And in other words, we get in the Z coordinate of both of the circle. So finally, we can calculate the 3D distance based on the two uh, 3D coordinate. And we do we will uh, do in a real time poll of late using the Mapoli function. Thank you. You didn't open your mic. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so let me repeat myself. So you can see here that what we get from the uh, OD is the RGB frame. Well, in this case, it's BGR frame. And then we also get a disparity map. And then what we're going to do is that we'll, first, we're going to uh, try to look for whatever is red and whatever is blue on the image. OK? So to do that, the best way that we have come up with is to change the image into HSV, which is a, like a cyclical color scale. And then we will uh, look in the, into, that, into that color space uh, for the different hues, value, different hue values. And then in, we're going to kind of threshold the image based on that. So you will see soon enough. So, but the first thing is to get an image on HSV, right? Uh, here I could, I could, yeah, demonstrate, I could demonstrate the HSV. Okay. So here is what you will get if you Google HSV. No. Um, but you could see that, uh, for example, here. So HSV is the hue saturation value color space, uh, which we are going to look into the hues, the different hues. So this 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 circle is this circle on the top here. Uh, you can see that it goes from zero all the way around to you know, 360 in this case, and it at, at different uh, degrees here, different degrees here represent different hues of color. Um, so what we what we trying to to select is this part here, this this little part that corresponds to the red color of our sticker, right? That that you can see that I have in my hand right now. Um, but in OpenCV, they they, they don't go all the way to 360. They actually go up, up until 180. So I'm trying to, so the first thing is to select, is to select a, a lower bound. So we're gonna, we want to mask, mask red object. And we're gonna select our lower red. When I define a lower red, that is going to be a, a at the lower bound of our threshold is going to be 0, then 180, and then 50. And then we're going to define an upper red. And then it's going to be empty array. And let's go to 5. And then 255. Five. Two five five. Okay, and then my 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 mask 
red is going to be CV2, whatever is in, whatever is in range of, I'm gonna take my image HSV, I'm gonna check for the lower bound and the upper bound. And I wanna plot, I wanna show this one. Uh, uh, so I go, Oh, so for the question before, I think I I, I plotted this one using CV2 IM show. Sorry, I, I didn't I didn't use the Maplotlib. I, I used the Maplotlib for this trajectory one. Um, just to clarify on the person who asked that question from before, uh, CV2 IM show, and I show my mask red. And I'm going to show my mask red. And in addition, I also want to show I want to show the RGB image so that we can make sure that everything is matching. And I also need to for not forget that I uh, this final condition to terminate. CV2, if CV2, I am CV2 weight key, one is equal to the ordinator key Q, then we're going to break the while loop. So let's, let's, let's run this to see what, what do we get. So I'm running it. I will hear a sound. Uh, oh, yeah, because blocking. Uh, the blocking is not written correctly. It's supposed to be, there's a misspelling here. Uh, let me let me close this one and open it again because apparently the um yeah so let's run this again to see if it's working oh well it will be better if I save it right otherwise I'm gonna register the changes Okay, so now you can see that the image that my camera is capturing, the camera is directly pointing at my table. Now let me just hide some of these notes that I have here. And it's kind of like picking up, it's, it's looking at this blue and this red. And if I move this red circle, if I move this red circle here, you can see how in the mask it is, it is also moving. Uh, so hold on for a second. So, but the still the, the the this this thing is still picking up. Uh, it's not very it's not very good yet because you can see that it, it cannot pick the the circle entirely, and that's because the the red in the HSV color scale, as I mentioned before, is cyclical, right? It's also trying to pick up some some stuff from my hand. That's because my hand apparently it's also red, uh, like reddish, right? So if, so here we have the HSV color scale because uh, we are picking up this part, but we also need to pick up from the, uh, from the end of this color spectrum that is also red, right? In order for us to pick the whole red, uh, the whole, everything that is red. So in addition to this, we need to, We find another lower red boundary. In this case, our lower red boundary is going to be from 170 because the maximum is 180. In OpenCV, the maximum Q value is 180. It's gonna be 
And then we're going to go from 170 to 180, which is the maximum. And we're going to add this result to our previous mask. So we're going to let mask red be whatever was before on the mask red plus the new result. We're gonna, uh, oh, sorry, not CVT color. C2 in range of whatever of my, so I'm going to check in my HSV image for the lower threshold and the upper threshold. And then I run this code to see what do I, Oh yes, it's supposed to be a list. So let's make it a list. All right, so. <clears throat> uh, Jose? Yes. Somebody in YouTube chat say means the array symbol. Yes, yes, that, that's, uh, that's, thank you for that. I, uh, mm. I, uh, I just corrected that. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, that's, that's why I like to code and test it as I go because otherwise imagine if if I if I just write a lot and didn't look at that. Yeah, but now you can see that now the red one is very nicely selected and I can move it like this, right? And you can see how it also moves. And but it's still picking up some stuff from my hand, which is you know not ideal. Um I, I would also like to mention that um these values, right, we could optimize by ourselves, but in this case, because uh, we're dealing with different kind of illumination, I mean, in this case for the workshop, we're different with different kind of illumination, different kind of backgrounds. Uh, this is just like a, a ballpark of what these values will be like. Uh, in for the for our box, we can actually fine tune these ones so that they can be very specific to what we can do, to, to what we want to do. So it, the detection will be much better in that case. Uh, but now I have gotten my red mask. I want to do the same thing for. The blue one. So I need to define the lower. If I define a lower red, I will define a lower blue. All right. So the blue is half of this. Uh, let's say, well, a little bit like maybe 95. And then 180. And then 50. And then my upper. Blue is going to be empty array. And then let's go all the way to, let's say, uh, 125 or 130, 125, 255, 255. And I'm going to do the same thing. So mask blue is going to be whatever is in range gonna check right in my HSV image for whatever is in range of the lower blue and the upper blue okay and I also want to plot that one So that will be mask blue. It's going to be just comma mask blue. All right. So <clears throat> let's see what do we get when we run this one. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. So take a look at my RGB frame. I'm moving my red circle right now. Right. And then I'm covering my black circle, my, my blue circle. You see how when on the mask blue is completely hidden now because it cannot be seen by the camera. So now it apparently is detecting the circles, right? But it's also picking up. So for example, oh, it's interesting that it's picking up a lot of the stuff from my head. Uh, yeah, so we are picking up the circles and we're picking a little bit of the other like stuff around it that there's maybe like, like I will categorize this as noise. Um, so now, 
what we want to do according to our flow chart is that we want to use the half circles diagram to detect on the masks that we got what looks like a circle on those masks right so that can help us like filter out everything for example like you see that this show that I, it, it picked up my hand hopefully that can be you know eliminated by us doing this uh this selection of circles so but in this case we i, I kind of want to like remove all of those those little uh things that you saw like the, the little noises so for that i think it will be better if i just apply a gaussian blur to this mask before i push i push them through the half circle because the half circle actually looks at the gradients and then it will try to look at the uh at, at the grains of your image and and then you will try to you know draw edges on there and then from those edges you will try to select the circles there will be a um uh clear explanation of the half circles in a, in a bit but just for our purposes we want to just apply a uh, blur a gaussian blur i believe is the it's like this mask red then the next one is going to be the kernel size and then this parameter i forgot what uh i, I forgot i think this is the standard um good good i forgot what is parameter but i know that usually i set it to zero let me do this for also the blue one So what is a Gaussian blur? The Gaussian blur is just going to run a Gaussian kernel of size five times five on the image but then to make it a little bit smoother. So let's see, what do we get when I run this one now with the Gaussian blur? Okay, so you see that it's, it's a little bit better and now all of these noises like uh, here, they seem to be attenuated because when you look at the surrounding pixel of these noises, right, they tend to be uh, uh, surrounded by black, but the, the surrounding is, is black, so it will make them much more grayer than, than the circles. And you can see that now the circles are pretty clear in the image, except, well, this, this case, because it's picking up my hand, right? The, the inside part of my hand. Uh, but for, for the red one, it will be much, much better for the blue one as well. So now the next step is to run the uh, half circle on this Gaussian mask, uh, on these uh, blurred images, sorry. Uh, so we're going to define circles red, going to be CV2 half circle. Oh, so by the way, um, last from last uh, workshop, there were several people who commented that they didn't have the OD right, um, so that they couldn't follow us when we were doing like the installation and control the cameras. So, for example, all of this, uh, all of this post processing stuff, you could do it without the OD. Like you, you could record the the videos before previous before, beforehand, and then just use the same post processing that I'm using right now. To you know, detect circles, or in this case, we also want to uh, you know, it, it um, draw squares and stuff like that on the circles. Um, so in our lab, what I always recommend is that if you want to learn how to use a function, one of the best ways that you could do is to simply is to simply look at the documentation. In this case, let's look at the half circle. So what is what is this telling you? So half circle is telling you that it, it wants an 8-bit single channel gray input scale image. I think that's what we got with our mask. So I'm gonna give it the circles red is going to look for circles in the red mask. Then it also wants what? It wants 
uh, the inverse ratio of the accumulator. Let me set that to one. Uh, and then it wants a minimum distance between circles. Since we are dealing with a case where the, the circles can be very close, I think uh, maybe a minimum distance of three would be fine. Uh, what else does it want? A param one, which is uh, the parameter for the, for the first method specific parameter and param two. I think maybe my assistant Rick can give you a little bit of explanation of these two parameters and maybe you could give a rundown of how does the half circle work, uh, Rick? Okay. Uh, so the first set of half circle is you will detail edge by using the Kenny edge detector. So the parameter one is actually for this step. It's, you can imagine the parameter is like a threshold for the edge detector. And the uh, next step is you guys edge and you will, we will guess a radius or guess a range of radius. In here is a linear radius equals this maximum radius equal to 12. So we get the radius and we construct a new circle and the, we will put the circle on the edge to detect previously. And the next piece of the edge also we will like we will put the circle on the edge each piece of this edge. So you can imagine it will be very uh from this, from this geometrical construction, the original circle center position will receive the highest score. The highest score means the the more intersection of the edge of the circle. So the parameter rule is actually for this graph it was for so if your parameter rule is very high means you need a very high score to that the algorithm thing gets the center of the circle. So similarly, if uh, you use the house code and you didn't get a result you want, like you didn't get any circle, usually you can change the parameter to, to a lower number, it usually helps. Yeah, I think. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, so I have here just added uh, several comments. So here we just convert the image to HSV. That's the first thing that we do. Then we mask for the red objects. We mask for the blue objects. And we blur the masks. And then we try to detect the circles. So now from our uh, load chart, the next thing we need to do is to find what is the pair of circles that is more likely to correspond to to the circles that are attached on our on our hand right so the way that we so we need to do like a nested loop for that but we need before that i need to check <laughs> whether it detected any circles right so if mpra of the circles red any and and the array of the okay so let me write this on this comment here. and this pair of circles and circles blue any uh if both of them are not none, then what is it gonna do? Ah, yes. So first of all, I wanna I wanna show you what kind of shape of the array you get when you actually retrieve the circles from from directly from this. Uh, so you will get, for example, circles red. I'm just gonna print the the what what the detections of the red circles. Oh, 
Oh, I'm, I, I, oh, sorry. I forgot. I forgot to follow my own advice. Uh, yes, this one, um, it also wants the method that's as the second parameter. I think it should be half gradient. Half gradient. It should be the second parameter, right? Uh, here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see what what's up. Oh, yes, it also has two commas, it's not gonna work. Um, okay, what is, what is, uh, what's, what's the error? Ma oh, max radius. Yes. Okay, so let me, oh, I don't wanna print the circle, I wanna print the shape of these things. Okay, let it crash for a little while. Let me run it again now when I'm printing the shape of the circles and not the circles it's, it, themselves. Um, okay, so let me stop it now. So what, 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 what is this? So you can see that here, uh, it's telling you that it always gives you this array shape where it returns one. And then it returns how many circles did you find? Did it find at that time for that frame? And then it returns you three items for each circle because circle in this case is defined by the center coordinates, right? So the X coordinate of the center, the Y coordinate of the center, and then the radius of that circle, right? So I want to remove this item of one so that I can get, for example, just this two dimensional array. Like for example, for this one, it will be three, three, right? instead of having this one all the time because that makes my my calculations a little bit not so good i mean not so convenient for me so right now instead of doing that i would just have circles red it's gonna be circles to remove that one in front you simply do like this it's gonna take the first one because it only has one and then circles blue is going to be Circles blue. Yeah. So now, the first I, I am used to having the first uh, element of the array represent how many things do you have, right? So I, I am more used to working like this. Now we need to iterate through all of the circles, right? And we need to check for each red circle. I'm going to check all the blue circles, and then I'm going to calculate the their. Uh, they're up the absolute value of the of the residuals of of the radiuses of the red eye, and then I'm going to check: does this value is this value lower than a threshold that I have uh, that I have before, right? And if it is, then I'm going to save that pair, and I'm going to replace that threshold with the with, with uh, the new lower threshold. So let me create that nested loop right now. So for i in range so i is going to iterate through the red circles circles red and now the first element corresponds to how many red circles do you have right and then for j in range and j is going to iterate over the blue circles Detection of the blue circles. Okay, so what is it going to do? First, we need to calculate the, uh, the, the, the error of, well, the absolute value of the error for the red, red eye. So we just um, get the absolute value of uh, so as I told you before, the third element of the circles is 
the radii, so it will be circles red, the third element, which in Python is two, because in Python we started with zero. And then gonna have circles blue, also the third element, okay? And what's gonna happen? I, I calculate this, this absolute value of the residuals, and then I need to look, okay, does this value, is this value lower than a certain threshold? So I'm gonna start with a threshold of maybe 10. 10 is a high value. So this, this value is just going to initialize, it's, a, it's gonna be a high value so that uh, you could have 100 if you want here, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, and then if the circle R error, if the circle R error is lower than the R threshold, I'm gonna save the pair and I'm gonna replace the threshold with this error. So if circle R error is lower than the R threshold, then what's gonna happen, I'm gonna have a, gonna have a, a, a variable name pair that is going to store IJ. So IJ corresponds to, okay, to this index of the red circles and J corresponds to the index of the blue circles, what else am I gonna print? What else am I gonna save? Uh, I'm going to make the R threshold B circle R error. Okay, and let me print, uh, let me print the uh, pair and also the radii of the two circles. So let me run this. Uh, I think you forget I in the uh, line 82. Oh, yes. Here should be I, yes. My bad. Should be I here, yes. Otherwise, I'm going to get. Yeah, something <laughs> that is not good. Yeah, yeah, and it should be J. Okay. On, uh, oh, what's going on? Oh, yes, because I, here I also need I and J. Save it. All right, so it's telling me so here it's telling me that it found a pair. For example, here it always starts at zero zero, right? That's always going to be the the first pair that it found because usually uh, these these circles are lower than ten. Uh, and then it's telling you that the best pair is circle number four in that, in the red circles and we circle, well, circle number five because in Python you start at zero. And then the, the third circle in the blue array and it's telling you that both of them are have identical red eye. And okay, so now I have my spare circles. Now, the next thing that I wanna do would be would be to plot a bounding box, right? On this uh, uh on the on the on my RGB frame. All right. So let me define my X red is going to be circles red. Oh, first let me get. Let me get out the values of my pair. So P1, P2 are gonna be the values inside pair. So let's say red circles is always uh, with P1 for the best red circle. So we're gonna be red circles, P1, zero. 
uh, so if, let's make it x red y red for the center portion of that circle the circles red circles red still p1 but now the second element i could make that a tuple and then let's have x blue y blue be the similar thing but with the blue circles circles blue now circles blue is with p2 the first element and then circles blue p2 the second element All right um, so now both of these are going to not necessarily have the same radius, but I would like to have the bounding box, the sizes of the bounding box be the sizes of the average radius. So let me calculate also the average radius. The average R is just the uh, MP mean of the circles red. P1, and this will be the third element together with the circles uh, blue. Now, P2, uh, also the, the third element. Okay, so now I'm going to create a bounding box. So, typically in OpenCV, you require the, just two points to make the bounding box. What it, it is the the x mean, y mean, so the left most, most, you know, down point, and then the right most, most upper point of the bounding box, so that you can draw it. So I'm gonna define that right now. So let me call it B box red is going to be um, uh, x red minus average r. Uh, and you're gonna have also y red minus average r. Then you want the other point, so x red is the center, right? Plus average r, and then y red plus average r. So also uh, now all of these numbers are Floating, floating points because when you get the mean right you divide you do a division operation but for the bounding box when you want to plot the bounding box OpenCV likes to have uh, integer numbers right because they, they they look at which pixel right the coordinates of which pixel and they cannot deal with the uh, floating point coordinates of pixels so we want to make it all of this to be integers so we might we will make it an empty uh, MP array first and then we make it as type Int. Um, yes, seems fine. So, okay, so also, let me also write this comment plot B boxes around circles. Uh, then we do the same thing for the blue circle. So B e box blue is MP array of the uh, X, in this case is X blue minus average R, Y blue minus average R, X blue plus average R, Y blue plus average R. And let me make this an integer array. Okay. Um, and then the next step would just be to plot a rectangle. Right. Um, so for the rectangle, I believe that 
what it wants first of all is the oh, on which image do you want me to plot it so it's going to be on the rgb frame uh then, then it requires two stuff that the two coordinates that i told you so i'm going to make a b box red let's plot the red one first so b box red zero b box red one and then the, then we require the other two points so b box red two and b box red three. Oh my god why is it go outside and then uh then i think the next one that he wants is which color what color do you want the bounding box to be since i have a red and a blue sticker i would like to make it a green bounding box so with bgr it should be the second zero two five five zero and then a line width right then the line will let me make a tree so let's see let's let's try to run it right now to see if we can actually plot this rectangle over the red circle oh wow uh doesn't want to make it an integer oh because it's misspelled yes i think if i type it correctly it'll be better and it'll work okay what's good aha uh -huh. okay so it's trying to pick up my hand but you can see now it's trying to pick up the the red circle right now seems like it's pretty much picking up the red circle all the time uh, the camera does some focusing and stuff like that and seems like it's working pretty nicely now let's do the same thing for the blue circle actually i think the line is too big maybe make it a two and for the blue circle it's similar right c2 rectangle plot on which on which image on the rgb frame we want to plot to have the coordinates of the bounding box so in this case it will be b box blue zero and then b box red one sorry sorry b box blue <laughs> V box blue one and then um v box blue two and then v box blue three and then it wants the color right so let's make it green as well zero two point five zero and then also with a with a uh line width of two so let me run this one Oh. So now I speak in my belt because the reflection makes it look like it's blue. You can see. That it's trying to pick up. Yes, yeah, the blue and the red circles. Pretty much picks them up like all the time. um so yeah so that's the first part of our algorithm right detecting the circles uh we are now are gonna take a five minutes break and we will return to uh calculate the depth of these circles and also uh, plotting the euclidean distance in 2d and in 3d and we'll do a little comparison of these two distances so we will be back in five minutes okay Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, hope that you enjoyed that five minute break. Um, so now let's go back into the code. Uh, what is it that it is left for us to do here? So the next thing is to calculate from this ROI, we need to calculate the depth. So uh, let's do that right now. Mm. 
when I write calculate depth of ROI. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Well, our ROI is already defined by our bounding box, right? We already plotted the, the bounding box in the in the RGB image. So now that coordinates of the bounding box also define our ROI. So, um, for example, the red disk, red box disk, um, red box disparity would just be the this, from the disparity frame, right? We're gonna kind of crop that little part and that's that it goes from X to X and from Y to Y. Uh, so it will be B box uh, red. Uh, so the X's are the first one and the third one. So B box red zero. Oh, but in in this case it will be flip, right, guys? So it will be from one to it will be y. It will be y, y and then x. B box red one all the way to B box red three, and then from the other one is gonna be B box red zero all the way to B box red two do the and then we're gonna do the same thing for the blue one so gonna kind of like look at the disparity image and just crop that little area so blue box this is going to be the from the disparity frame the b box blue one all the way to b box blue three then going to be from b box blue zero all the way to b box blue two so now we have this blue box these red and blue boxes of the disparity map that uh contain the pixels right that inside this roi so now we need to look at uh from this box which elements are non-zero and then we want to calculate the mean of those elements so we want to do a uh, red disparity red disparity is going to be the mean of uh, the elements in these boxes that are non-zero. So red box this, but we only want to look at the elements that are non-zero. So MP mean, MP, MP non-zero of red box this. Similarly, we have a blue disparity. This is the average disparity in that bounding box in the ROI. So MP mean of the blue box mm. disparity, but only the non-zero elements. Because uh, so uh, I would like to elaborate that the reason for why we pick the non-zero elements is because uh, OD. Whenever you cannot calculate the disparity for a certain pixel, it assigns it a zero, right? So that's why we're trying to look at the elements that are non-zero in this case to, to avoid that kind of stuff. Um, a blue box is, okay. Now, um, the problem right now is that disparity is not the same as depth. Um, they, 
Depth and disparity, as we mentioned in the previous uh, workshop, they are inversely proportional concepts, right? If you came to the previous workshop, you would you would know that uh, actually, so the relationship between uh, depth and disparity is the following. So if you look at my uh, uh, editor right now, it will be the the depth will be equal to the focal length times baseline distance. And then all of this will be divided by the disparity. OK? So last time, we tested the minimum depth that you can uh, find with the OPD. So that depth would be 34.5 centi centimeters with a maximum disparity search of 95, right? So that means that uh, we need, if we want, we, then the depth and disparity are just separate, are, are, are uh, related by this focal length times baseline distance value, which, which we can just quickly find here. So this will be 34 times, 34.5 times 95, right? Let me just pull out my calculator. For the, this is for the OV. So it will be 34.5 times 95. That means that uh, it, this value is 30, 32, 3277.5. Okay. Um, so that means that if I have a uh, disparate, so that means that the depth, red depth, is this number 30, 37.5 and i want to divide without getting a remainder so that i can get like nice short numbers divided by the disparity okay that's going to give me my depth in centimeters and similarly we're going to have the blue so uh, if for example you were to use the uh no this is a, no so let, let's continue 3277.5 and then divided by the blue disparity and okay um now the next thing is i would like to plot this well first we can print this one and do a little test mm. let me print red is and blue disp Okay, it's filming a little bit too much on the on my legs. Let me touch this one. All right. So now I will get uh, this ruler and that i have here and then i will try to calculate uh the distance from the red one to the ogd and it is giving me sorry um well first of all let me plot the disparity map to make sure that i'm getting values that are within the range um, um let me do cv2 i'm show this party 
Uh, then this parity frame. And then, oh, I need to normalize it first. Um, 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 uh, this parity frame is going to be my disparity frame. In this case, since we are, we know that we are not using extended disparity, we just divide by 95 and then multiply times 255 to get the integers. And then we make it as type u int 8. Okay, now I cannot. Now I cannot see my command line. Okay, let me restart my command line. A little bit smaller. Oh, sorry. Test that five. Okay. Seems. Okay, to me. But there is something not working very well. 77. Um, let me see if I made this correctly. Blue box. There's something wrong with this disparity. I think there's something wrong with the red disparity. Can you help me check my hackers? Uh, but it's okay. So um, if I if I take my my ruler and I put it like very, I mean as close as I can to to the camera from my blue circle, it will give me 95. And if I put it, oh, sorry, 90, sorry, 45, 45 centimeters, which is what I'm getting currently. But for the red circle, it's supposed to be around 41. Um, Jose? Yes? Um, some comment from YouTube is that red depth to red disk. Oh yeah, sorry. It's a blue death. Yes, there's yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, it should be this one. Who said that comment? Um Yang Le Do. Nice. Should be depth, yes. I should print it the depth. Not a disparity. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Uh so now I think it should be fine. So I need to make sure, one of the things that we need to make sure is that the, this thing is not producing uh, the, the noise because for example, it's here you see my hand, right? If I put the hand closer, you see that it starts to fail. That's when I reach lower than 34 centimeters. Uh, but now let's take a look at the command line. So now you see the, uh, I'm getting 42 for the red one and I'm getting like 44 for the, for the blue one. If I move the, the blue one like further away, I'm getting like, uh, 48, getting 46 right now. Uh, if I move, uh, for example, my hand starts to fail. Let's take, let's take a look at when my hand starts to fail. Uh, it will be like around here. 
So that would be maybe roughly 34, 35. Oh, and it's to find both circles. Sorry to give you the answer. You see it's getting you 35. That's just before it starts to fail. Can you see the command line here? Uh, so the, apparently the table is like 41 right here. So give you 42, 41. Um, yeah, so, so then the last thing that I want to do, it would be to just, uh, print on top of the, print on top of the bounding box, the, the depth. And then I will also like to print, then I also like to calculate the Euclidean distance between the points. Um, so yeah, so let's check first because sometimes I, I see as you see I get none values. That's because uh, probably there's some none values in the box in when I calculate this mean or, or when I get the non-zero things. Um, meaning that like at some point like it's like everything is zero. Um, that will be probably when you know uh, there is the uh, above that minimum. The, above the minimum uh, depth. So let me check if uh, red depth. Oh, so if empty is none, so this is gonna give me a boolean of whether it is a none or not. It is false and uh blue depth is also false so it means that i have something inside there um then i'm gonna see what you put text put text so where am i gonna put it in the rgb frame right um then i think is what text do i want to put then I want to put the put, put a red one. I want to put the red depth. Uh, red depth plus, and I want to put it as centimeters. Um, then the next one, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the next one will be the font, no? My hackers, can you? Check if this is true. First. This one should be the position. Oh yeah, sorry, the position. And the uh, font is the next one. Yeah, so the position will be as a topo, right? I will. I think it will be B box. What B box? Red. Uh, zero and one, no. And then the then the the, the, the font, um, then it will be the size, no? Yes. And then the color. So let me make it green again. Uh, is that it? Uh, well, let's check. If it's not, then I'm gonna find out right now. Okay. Seems like it's working. Give me forty-two. Um, and then um, so let's do the same thing for the blue one. And then gonna be what text I'm gonna put? It's gonna be the blue text. And where am I gonna put that? We're on top of the blue box. 
zero and then b box blue one and then going to be the font and then the the line width and then what color do i want it um oh so i also if i have this i also want to calculate the distances so i'm gonna have my distance in 3d so those for those of you who don't are not familiar with this distance formula is just the square root of the square residuals for all of the three dimensions so it's going to be an empty square root of what oh so there's another thing right now we are dealing with centimeters right so we want to get the this distance of the of the x and y in terms of centimeters as well so for that what we do is that uh, we know that this sticker is actually uh, 0 0.7 centimeters in diameter and, then we, and we know that these two are more than likely going to be rough, uh, roughly the similar size right in diameter so <clears throat> to do that we calculate this unit ratio there's going to be 0 0.7 centi uh, centimeters and then we're going to divide this by the average r okay so for this one when we want to because we want to have all the all of our uh differences in 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 terms of centimeters so it will be unit ratio times x red times times this times x red minus x blue and then we're going to square all of this then plus uh unit ratio we're going to do the same thing times with the x so now we do the blue y red minus y blue and then we're going to square all of this again that's going to give us our x and y in terms uh, i mean uh, our distance in terms of centimeters for the x and y and now we also need to add the um, b oh sorry the left so okay actually let, let me rename this one z red let me rename it to z red so that we can have xyz um and then this is just gonna be z red minus z blue and we're gonna square that difference as well okay um so that's gonna give us our distance in 3d let us also calculate the distance in 2d to to compare uh, i think because you change your name so you should change your name in oh yeah yeah right yes you're right you're right you're right thank you is that it is this the only thing oh no here as well okay that's fine it's just one more Um, um, um so let me call the distance in 2d so the distance in 2d is basically the same thing but without this z one without this z term all right <clears throat> so uh let's try this let's see what's up Yeah, seems reasonable. Except when it's trying to detect stuff on my pant. Or my watch or my 
Well, let me see if I have a different sticker. Uh, can, can somebody pass me the, the, the box with the stickers? Maybe you have a different sticker than this one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. This. Uh, seems like this sticker is a little bit better. A different shade of blue as well. Um, so, um, good. So now, um, lastly, the last thing will be um, less uh, plots, the Euclidean distance for different frames. Um, so we will do it here. Uh, so PLT plot. Oh, so the first thing will be to give the frames I, some numbers. So let's assign n to be. Let's assign this variable n to start at zero, and every time it will add one. And then we're going to attach that to some list. I am going to initialize this variable in a second. But we're gonna attach n in here, and then we're gonna have a. We're gonna attach. We're gonna append um, our distances also to this list. Distances 3D to when I create a list, append all the results of our distances. Okay, so let me initialize that uh, here outside the while loop. So let n start at zero. So that we don't have any frame. Then we also let the distance to this start at zero. And we let the distance in 3D start at zero as well. And then we initialize this empty list. So the empty list are frame noon. We need to be an empty list. Then distances 3D, which which gonna have a list of all of our distances. Well, distance 2D is gonna be C, empty list. And distances 3D also gonna be an empty list. Okay, so what's gonna happen now? So now I have a list. So I can just plot this. Plot on the x axis is going to be the frame num, the number of the frames. But I only want to plot the last 50. And then I also want to plot the distances to the, but also only the last 50. And I'm going to plot that what color will be nice? Green. And then we, we also I also want to do the same for the 3D ones. Gonna be the last 50. And also the last 50 distances in 3D. And let me plot that with a red line. And then just let me uh, have the uh, axis, the, the labels for the axis, frame number, PLT, Y label, PLT, Y label is going to be you click and this stance is going to be in centimeters. Uh, then I'm going to PLT pause for just a little while, so 0 0.05. And then I'm going to add each iteration of the while loop. I'm going to clear it, clear figure, CLS. OK, let's see. This should be the last thing for today's workshop. Just let me do a little demonstration.
Okay, so right now, both stickers are basically at the same. You can see, oh, you cannot see it right now. But here we have the red line plotted on top of the green line. Uh, so it gets this peak when it tries to detect something that is not there, like detect my watch or something. Uh, but you can see that here, uh, we're getting the distances basically identical. That's because they are both at the same um, level, so to say. Uh, if I if I come here and I try to plot this one here, I will get that there is a roughly, I would say like almost, almost six. Yeah, so you're getting like seven, eight. Uh, so what happens if I get, for example, my red sticker. So what? Uh, let's say that we have a protocol, right? And in our, in our protocol, we have specified very clearly how the subject needs to do the test. But uh, let me put this down. But uh, sometimes the, the instructor forgets to explain the test or, or, or just the subject doesn't like to follow the instructions of how to do the test, right? So we need to, I, we believe that by using these 3D uh, distances, we can make our method more robust because for example, you see now I have this, these two stickers uh, close to each other, right? And they're basically identical. But now let's see if, like let's say for example, the subject tries to do the test in such a way that uh, the distances look, the distances in 2D look similar, but the sub, because the subject is moving just maybe one sticker in front of the camera, like for example, like this one. Here I have the sticker in 2D, right? They're basically the same. Well, now it's trying to pick my hand up. Um, oh, what can I use? Maybe my mask. So let's see. So if I move my red sticker a little bit up, you can see how well it's having trouble detecting because it's trying to detect my hand as well. So you can see there's a little separation between the distances. Well, let me see. So the distance I'm trying to move the this thing as close to the perpendicular to the camera as possible but it's kind of like hard to see when it's trying to detect my chair in my hand but you can see that there's a there's a little separation between the distances now even though they supposed to have similar similar to these distances And yeah, so with that, I would like to uh, finish uh, the coding session for today. If for next time we would try, we will work on the uh, 3D CNN part. So that's that, that's the analysis from our pre-recorded videos. Um, I would like to give the audience maybe some time to. Or, or maybe Rick or Jacob, would you like to make any comments on this? No? Uh, in our chat, the last time had some uh, question, and he asked about uh, uh, this coordinate is based on the world uh, coordinate system or the camera? It's, oh, wait, it's on wait. the camera. I'll say before you start, since Seva is in our Google Meet, so what about we have the online Q and A session? Sure. And um, let us set up the system so we can be online. I, I was lost. Um, 
you are calculating the Euclidean distance from the 2D uh, plane of the camera or for, or for the 3D real world coordinate system? Oh, my camera. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Um, I have another question, um, okay. if it is possible. Um, that, that's, yeah, so that's a... The, what, what a second, Sebastian. Um, let me just take some technical problems here. Uh, so, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's relative to the camera, yes. Ah, okay, so when you put the red, the red bottom on your pencil, it's only calculate the distance on the plane between the two uh, bottoms, the, between the red and the blue. Yes, 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 correct. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so for your question. So the, the, then we must need the the conversion to obtain the the Euclidean distance on the three D um, coordinate system, right? Uh, yeah. So so our idea was to use this depth, right? Because Right now it's just a plane, right? So we we know the size of the sticker, and we know the radius of these stickers, right? I mean the the based on the half circle, it will give you the radius. So the radius is dependent on the on uh, on the distance from here to here, right? From the camera. So I, I know you cannot see my camera, but I'm trying to uh, illustrate that. Uh, for example, when a sticker is far away, the radius is far, right? The, the radius is small, right? Yes. Uh, so that can it, so we can convert centimeters to 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 the distance, the difference in pixels to centimeters that way for the two D. But the problem is that we want to get that three D distance, right? So the three D distance is calculated, yes, with the with the depth map. That's our that's like our idea, right? Okay, Add okay. the depth information to, um, you know, give that extra dimension, right? Because okay, okay. Uh, what I wanted to demonstrate the problem was that um, it was trying to detect my pencil, so there were like high peaks, but you could see like. For example, when a, when a subject, um, let's say, moves his finger like towards the camera, that you the two D distance will be similar. But in reality, the subject is moving the fingers. That, that, that there, there's a distance between the fingers, right? Yes. Um, or, or maybe uh, I mean, directly to the camera is the most extreme example. But you know, it could be like an angle like this, right? It it, it wouldn't necessarily be perpendicular all the time. Maybe it would be like this, and it would be moving it like this. So the two distance yes. would be the same. But if you can calculate the depth, right? then it will be much more accurate what, what we're trying to do. Uh, so that, that, that's the whole point in trying to add depth uh, and spatial, uh, to convert this into a spatial AI, right? So, mm -hmm. great, great. Uh, so can I make some extra question, please? Yes, sure, no problem, no problem. Um, and right now I, I'm um, working in, um, in the development of a... Um, people counter from the bus transportation system here in Chile. So right. first we are using a, an a OACD array camera. Uh, so we are using uh, YOLO detectors or SSID detectors from Mobilenet. You mean single shot detector? Right? Single shot detectors. Um, we construct an overhead view data set from inside the buses. Uh, but there is some problems with the, some metrics obtained with the training. So we are we are trying to make some improvements on the data set to obtain a better metrics. But uh, we are uh, thinking about to use a more classical approach, just like uh, using a huge circle detection. Mm -hmm. But but for in the case of the top view from this camera, from the OED camera, we have some problems because there is a lot of people, just like the woman passengers, oh, they that have, have the hair. hair. Uh -huh, yes. yes, and you lost the the, the 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 circular perimeter. So in that case, we have not testing the huge uh, circle detection. But what do you think about it? It is possible to to obtain a, a good detection, considering that the uh, that things just like the long hair. Yeah, no, only the long hair. What about when they wear, for example, hats? Right, it, it, it totally distorts the head. Um, in our experience, um, well, you what you would like to change there, right, will be this parameter two because this parameter two is the accumulator threshold. Like so, <clears throat> so if you remember what the explanation that my assistant hacker gave was that uh, basically half circle 
they they will have like an it's like a voting of where like they will, it will draw the edges right and then from the edges you will try to make like a this maybe not the best explanation but like a voting of where the cent a circle is based on the point based on the points of the edges right um and the accumulator is the threshold so a high accumulator value would give you things that are very likely to be circles right and a low accumulator value will give you values we will give you circles that you know not, are not necessarily circles like ovals and stuff like that for our case we use a low value because uh we want to our circles are not all the time perfect like the time like what you're saying so we get a lot of false positives uh so you can use half circles and try to maybe play with that accumulator value this parameter too um but you're gonna get a lot of false positives and then that can help you you know to I mean, if you have the raw image and you want to get a starting point, right? I just want to feel like a better guess of where the heads are. You could use this half circle, but definitely you will need to use something else, something else to post-process those results, it's right? Like, like we did, right? We, right now, we filter first by color, and then we filter first, then, then we filter by shape, right? That, that's what we did. So you might need to do something similar like that to get the, the accurate results. Uh, that would be like my recommendation for you. Um, yeah, but interesting, interesting thing that you're working on. I like it a lot. Oh, thanks a lot. And I have a, a, another question. Uh, you have a, la a Latin uh, name. You you have a, a, a Latin parent. You are from yes. I am actually half Chinese and half Honduran. I'm from Honduras. Honduras. I'm Honduran I national. Yes. Ah, very good. Yes. Soccer, soccer yes. playing. Yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> very nice to see another Latino people joining our workshop. Yes, thanks to you guys. <laughs> yes, well, thanks, thank you for your so questions. Very, 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 uh, we're very grateful for 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 your comments. Mm -hmm. Thanks. If you thanks have so any, you. Uh, you and you are more than welcome, uh, and all everybody in the audience to join the third workshop. The third workshop is going to be actually more deep learning, and it's actually the part that for me. I feel like the most passionate about, uh, and I feel like the things that you could do the most, um, um, because it's gonna be your the analysis, and that is like, you know, what I like to do. So you're welcome to join that one. I, I promise it's gonna be an excellent workshop. Thanks, and uh, it's, it's the same direction from the for the meet. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, we will have the same meeting address. Yes. Yes. Thanks. You're Thanks welcome to check also like uh, the speakers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to yeah, you thank and you. all the Chinese uh, people there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, everybody. Uh, so lastly, I would just like to thank all of you for joining our workshop. Um, thank you for all of you for your support. Uh, you're welcome to check the future workshops um and if you like what, we, what we're doing please give us a like on youtube and we hope to see you soon um thank you <laughs>